you've made an investment into that house. So imagine you have now this technology that allows you to take 10% of the value of the asset and liquidate it so that you can reinvest it into something else. On the other side, you have people who want to do an investment into real estate. Here you can actually say, I like Sarah's property, I'll invest 10K. And that's exactly what you can achieve with tokenization. Hello and welcome to Polyweb. I'm your host, Sara Landi Tortoli. My guest today is Denis Petrovic. In 2018, Denis co-founded BlockSquare with the vision to globally facilitate the use and adoption of real estate tokenization. In this episode, we will explore how Web3 can revolutionize the real estate industry. We discuss the potential impact for investors and developers, as well as the current regulatory landscape. So buckle up and enjoy this episode. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. You are the CEO of a company called uh, BlockSquare. And BlockSquare is a very early mover in the web-free prop tech space. Uh, maybe we can start uh, by talking about a little bit the story of your company, how did it came about, uh, and uh, what is it that you aim to achieve? The story behind BlockSquare goes back into, I'd say, around two, 2016. So very early on of Web3. And the mission of BlockSquare is to enable any real estate company or entrepreneur to basically migrate the value of real estate assets on chain and kind of facilitate that transfer with infrastructure. By infrastructure, I mean software and frameworks that are put in place so that others don't need to figure things out, but just utilize our APIs to achieve something that we call tokenization, but we can kind of enter more into it, what that means later on maybe. But yeah, as a backstory, BlockSquare actually emerged from a blockchain lab back in 2016 with uh, my co-founder, Victor. And so Victor owns a IT development company here in Slovenia. So we come from Slovenia, based mainly as a team in Ljubljana, although we've now grown in a decentralized fashion. And basically, we wanted to really understand where Web3 technology, and meaning blockchain, smart contracts can be utilized um, within different verticals of potentially clients that Victor's company already was serving, like governments, telecommunication companies. One of the clients of Medius, the company is also the National Lottery, for instance. So different, different types of uh, potential use cases, but we also were doing some real estate investments ourselves and we started saying, oh, we haven't researched the real estate kind of vertical yet. Let's see where this technology could be applied in the future. And through that process or research, we found a, um, a recipe for how to legally transfer value from a single real estate asset on chain. And then we decided to, uh, to make a business out of it. Yeah, and we're going to explore more uh, as the episode progress uh, about this. But let's go back to this initial discovery phase that you're doing. Could you please tell us uh, about what unique opportunities uh, Web3 offers uh, the real estate industry? Where we focus or where my focus li lies is mainly on the investment side. So, well the intersection of financing and investing into real estate and how Web3 can be utilized in that direction. But we've seen use cases like from the foundation of real estate, like where do we keep the records of ownership? So we're talking here about land registry systems, basically. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the first use case that probably pops in the mind of somebody that is looking into blockchain and then saying, oh, you know, we could have a land registry on the blockchain, right? And there's, there's has been a couple of companies that have been doing a lot of work in that direction. 
And so this is one of those perhaps use cases that's probably going to change the real estate industry the most, but it's also the, the further, the furthest away from implementation. So one area you mentioned is the investment uh, and uh, another area is the one of uh, registration or certification of ownership, if you want. So let's dive in, uh, in maybe the investment uh, area, which is the one that you're most focused on. In terms of uh, where this can change the real estate industry as such is basically access I, I say i think this is kind of the main the main driver for developing anything that relates to tokenization of real estate as enabling uh, greater access to investing uh, in a in an asset class and when you open up access you also kind of start questioning the re requirement of more or less structured investment products where you have all those layers in between the investor and the yielding asset that might be the real estate, right? And in between you have different management levels that eat up the revenues that are generated by that asset. And there's reasons for, for those layers to exist, of course, but one of the main reasons is trust. And here, transparency that blockchain technology can give to this kind of investment system because you have all those, you know, imagine there's thousands of eyes that can look into, into an investment. Yeah, absolutely. So let's make uh, maybe some concrete example. So how do you create this greater transparency uh, through tokenization? What would be the benefit, you know, of that? And uh, how does one go about it? Okay. So um, are we talking about the why uh, of tokenization or do you want to touch point on the how side? Because you know, let's, let's you... touch point on the, on the how side first. Okay. So let's say I have a house, right? Okay. So and I want to tokenize it, how do I yep. go about that? Okay. And then that once I understand the how, maybe why should I do that? What would be the benefit for me? Okay. So on the how, you have a house, all right? And, and that house uh, is, in this case, we're talking about you own the house, right? Now, we know how to tokenize, we figure out how to, tokenize real estate when it is owned by a legal entity. And there's a couple of reasons for it, but let's imagine that this house is owned by a limited liability company, right? Now, how we tokenize real estate is we have the shareholders of that uh, LLC that owns the title of the property, transfer economic rights that derive from the ownership of the asset onto token holders, which means whoever holds the tokens becomes the, the holder of a portion of the economic rights that derive from ownership of the asset. Because ownership is actually kind of dissected into different subcategories. And we just took the, um, the economic rights part out of it. Now, when you do that, you then, it means there's, there's this legal contract. It's a corporate resolution that is signed by the shareholder and through which the, the legal obligations of the issuer that is issuing the tokens towards token holders, um, and the token holders rights that, you know, are given to you whenever you hold a token. And then this legal part, the resolution is uploaded or is linked to a smart contract. And the smart contract is then the dynamic component of this tokenization. So we have a static one, which is the legal part, uh, which is just a normal legal document, a PDF that has been signed, either e-signed or signed in person or in presence of a notary. And then it, it is enhanced with a token contract. And that token contract lives on chain and it holds the information 
uh, of this legal document itself. And they work jointly, basically. And as soon as you do that, you now have a piece of code that nobody can delete. And you have tokens that can be held by thousands of people. And those tokens give them a direct stake in the asset that is underlying there. Now that how it's clear, but why should I do that uh, as a business? You know, why should I tokenize my property and distribute the ownership through this token? So there, there might be various reasons why you would do that. Let's just take the most kind of simple way of looking at this. You've made an investment into, into that house, right? So you've done it to, I don't know, lease it out on Airbnb. It's doing X amount per year of revenues. You've invested some equity. And then you have also raised some debt by the bank. So you received some financing by the bank. But imagine in two, three years time, your equity will grow. Why? Maybe the valuation of the asset has increased. Maybe the, the, you repaid probably some part of the debt, which means that in time you will have more equity in that property, which means that this is kind of locked in illiquid capital you have, but you can't really use it. You can't do anything with it. It's there, right? So imagine you have now this technology that allows you to take, I don't know, 10% of the value of the asset and liquidate it so that you can reinvest it into something else. Maybe you want to buy another property. Maybe you want to buy yourself a car. It really depends on the position you have as the issuer, what you can and cannot do with funds that you've received. On the other side, you have people who want to do an investment into real estate, but right now the only thing they can do is maybe invest in a real estate investment trust that yields miserably, honestly, compared to direct real estate investments. But of course, direct real estate investment require more management, more involvement. There's a higher entry point to it. Here, you can actually say, as an investor, you can say, hey, you know what? I like Sarah's property. It's great. It seems to be providing a good return. Yes, I'll invest 10K into her property. And that's exactly what you can achieve with tokenization. So basically it allows you to turn a very liquid asset, such as uh, real estate, right? Into a very liquid one. Maybe, maybe it can become very liquid one, but compared, compared to how real estate is right now, you're boosting liquidity totally. You can't really compare it, of course, with, you know, a stock market, because it's never going to happen that you're going to have the same liquidity as the New York Stock Exchange or something, or the crypto market for that. We're talking about small assets with their of value of 500 million, but then you can apply the same philosophy or the same principles onto commercial real estate of 50 million or something. So there probably those type of assets might have easier access to liquidity or more liquidity uh, on secondary markets. That's interesting. So as a shareholder, can everyone invest? And if yes, uh, what tokens do you get? How do you redeem them? Can you walk us through that? Theoretically, you could invest with as little as $1. And the question is, the seller of the token usually defines the terms, but the market on the other side defines the standards. So you have the seller kind of following the trends on the market, what parameters need to be set for a token sale to happen. And on this other side, you have investors had that choose to engage in, into those sales. But let's say that you could easily invest as little as $500 into a single property and di diversify across hundreds of properties if you wanted to in terms of, yeah distributing kind of your capital as an investor. And what type of upside uh, can investor look at by participating? Well, the, the token itself has value, right? That correlates to the asset. So let's say it's a property that's worth a million. You've bought one 
1,000 tokens, you get 1% uh, stake in that property. So with 1,000 1, tokens, that would mean you're holding $10,000 worth of, of property, right? The token should be holding a value of around $10 per token. And uh, then on the exit side, you have a couple of ways of how you kind of recoup that initial investment. Either, let's say it's a real estate development project that has been tokenized. The issuer is probably the developer uh, themselves. And what they do is they basically just um, buy back the tokens after a set period of time. Let's say it's two years. The project is developed. There's uh, sales of apartments happening, and then they uh, use those sales proceeds to buy back the tokens at a predefined valuation, maybe, or it can be a fluctuating one. Or then you might have another scenario where it's, let's say a business office space and, uh, and it has a 10 year lease and the office is generating some revenue. You buy into at the time of tokenization, you buy at a certain price in three years, you sell the token maybe to another investor who wants to buy it. So there's also this secondary market option as well. There's multiple ways of how people can utilize tokenization to structure their deal. But yeah, these are the most common two. You mentioned that uh, for various reasons, the tokenization aspect uh, right now, it's only possible for like legal entities, uh, right? So me as a private owner of a house, I, am I or am I not allowed, you know, to tokenize my property? And this leads me to kind of the next question, which is uh, what is the role of regulation and uh, the policies, you know, that surround uh, property tokenization. The policies that surround real estate tokenization are honestly, we don't have enough or it's not clear enough. And that's, I think one of the main reasons why this has not become mainstream yet. And, and regulation is existing. There's existing regulation that you can, you know, choose to follow, but many times it's also kind of prohibitive to do tokenization in a certain jurisdiction because of the requirements of regulators. In certain jurisdictions, you might not even be required to do anything because the regulator will say, you know, this is not our fight. We're not touching this yet. So there's obviously it touches mainly securities laws. Uh, so regulation that relates to investment vehicles, let's say, and this is usually heavily regulated in most places. So in terms of you as a person that owns a property, tokenizing it for the purpose of selling tokens and getting liquidity, which is the main reason why somebody would do it. There are certain challenges that don't really have anything to do with regulators, but it's had more to do with inheritance. So regulation that is just like standard stuff. Like what happens uh, when you die? What happens with you are an issuer, you've issued tokens, you've created, let's say a liability towards token holders, right? And now you cease to exist. So now this liability should be transferred together with the title of the property towards the beneficiary, which is whoever, whoever is inheriting the property from you. And in some jurisdictions, these laws would have also transferred this liability potentially, but in some, some places it's unknown yet what will, what would happen, right? So by having a legal entity doing the tokenization, what happens is that it kind of mitigate those risks because there's quite clear guidelines of what happens with inheritance of shares of a company. And that's what would happen basically standard procedure and the corporate resolution lives within that company and whoever is holding the shares of that company is basically required to follow the instructions of the resolution. All right. So it's basically more, uh, a series of circumstances, uh, let's say that makes it more difficult for private owners uh, 
but not really like regulation impediments. But going back to the regulation impediments, you mentioned that there is more in need of regulation here for these to become uh, much more adopted in the real estate. What type of regulation is it needed for these to become mainstream? I think that, honestly, I don't think there's much regulation that needs to be put in place. We already have the regulation surrounding AML, which requires identification of whoever is holding tokens. That's, then you have regulation on taxation, regulation on, um, that's a bit more complex when it comes to kind of, uh, globally taxing or ta creating a, a framework for taxing global citizens in a way, right? Because you now might have an asset in the Canary Islands, uh, where you're calling from might have holders of tokens from, I don't know, a hundred different countries potentially. And how do you process that taxation? And it's not, also, it's not that big of a deal because in many places there's something called withholding tax, which just needs to be paid for instance. And then we have regulations surrounding, are these tokens securities or not? And right now what we're doing is we're saying, or regulators are saying, Hey, this is everything is securities. Like any type of investment you want to push out to the world, it should be done by a licensed banking institution. And I think there's quite the reason for this to be pushed in that direction, but I, I'm not sure what will happen, you know, and, and, and I mean, would, would it be that bad if if this would be not just required to be basically a bank to offer investment products. I think we have cases where the lack of regulation is clearly showing that, that this should be done this way. But then we have other cases where banks are also failing to, to perform up to the expectations of regulation. So, you know, um, we will see in time what happens. And it's uh, an interesting uh, gray area. And I wonder how do real estate uh, clients uh, feel about uh, that? Uh, so what do you think also needs to change beside regulation to incentivize uh, a wider adoption? When I talk with people from real estate, they're honestly, they're quite happy that this is available. They're excited about it. They're, they want to use it. They, they want to do it, right? They want to use tokenization because they see that there's so many things that it could solve. And we're probably just scratching the surface right now. But the problem is they don't have certainty from regulators. Because what happens is many times they start exploring this and a regulator doesn't even answer, or maybe they answer with a no, not a no answer, but they don't say yes. They're just like, we're going to come back to you and they never actually do. So it's a very slow process. Mm -hmm. And we see this happen before with other products that were kind of tech enabled that the regulators just don't know what to do with it. And they're waiting out to see how things play out and then they introduce regulation. I think here it's going to be kind of uh, the sim a similar thing. We have on the same path, we have uh, regulations surrounding crypto assets. I think this is kind of going to influence whatever is starting to be regulated more and more in the cryptocurrency markets. And I think this is kind of then going to fall under this just because it's using blockchain as technology. And, and I think that's kind of welcome because then at least you can say, oh, we can use cryptocurrency regulation, just like before crowdfunding regulation was in place in countries. Now, for instance, you can say, oh, we're doing a real estate tokenization and we'll go under the crowdfunding licenses that have been put in place for instance. What are the most interesting uh, use cases that you've seen uh, so far? Uh, in the realm of tokenization. Let's pick just one um, that's maybe closer to, I don't know, depends on the audience, but let's, let's look at this 
as a perspective from somebody buying an apartment. You're buying in a, an apartment in a new development and this apartment is great, right? Let's say it costs 300K and the developer suddenly offers you to say, you buy 300K apartment, you're going to live in it, but they offer you as well to kind of optionally buy 3000 tokens of 20 other apartments in the same building at the same time you're purchasing your apartment, which give you a 3% kind of shareholding stake in those 30 apartments that, and those apartments are going to be rented out for short to midterm periods to tenants. And you're going to actually now turn something that is your kind of living expense in a way, it's an investment, it's still real estate, but, and top it up with portion of a revenue bearing real estate. Uh, investment just in the same deal. On the other side, you have the developer that just expedited the sale of his supply that he's bringing to the market because he's not now going to need to kind of sell those 30 units one by one, but he's offered you something different additionally. So I think this is kind of a, an interesting case how tokenization can be used and it's not crowdfunding. It's not actually used for financing an investment. Let's move one second towards the second use case uh, of, uh, of real estate. Because one, you mentioned, you know, it's investment and this process of tokenization. And the other is a representation of digital ownership uh, of a property through NFT. So we have recently seen the first house sold as an NFT in South Carolina, I believe. And I know that the UAE uh, is making bold moves uh, regarding, you know, the usage of NFT in the land registration process, which is what you were mentioning before. So what do you think is the future going to look like uh, for digital representation of, of ownership and uh, how do you think this is going to play out? I think that's, there's no other way than going in that direction. I think this is kind of, like we said at the beginning, land registration or property registration, whether that's with NFTs or uh, with a kind of decentralized registry system of sorts, it's probably how this is going to play out. And probably NFTs is the simplest way of actually doing that because it, you can use any blockchain infrastructure that's secure enough out there. I don't know how this is going to happen, but the principles are going to basically come from those experiments in a way. And we need to understand that what you mentioned is like, there's, it's a deed system in the U S so it's a bit different than a title and then a land registry system. But for instance, in Europe, we have land registry system, which are basically appointed by the court and any changes in the land registry system are usually proposed by notaries and on the other side, executed by the court. With the, with the deed system it is a bit different because whoever holds the deed can actually kind of claim ownership and there's no kind of trustworthy central registry that the deed holders need to actually trust for the deed to be valid. So it, it's a bit different. And the deed system is more, more like an NFT, right? It's hell because the deed is a certificate and, uh, and the NFT might be a certificate as well. Yeah. So might be a bit easier in the U.S. Huh? that it's already kind of geared towards a deed registration process, whereas in Europe uh, and other countries such as Europe, uh, you also have like kind of professions that are partly dedicated to these, like as you mentioned, the notary, et cetera. Uh, so maybe there will be a higher level of friction. And uh, how do you think can this friction be overcome? Like, is this future inevitable or uh, do you think uh, there is going to a high level of, uh, of resistance. But as always, when you go into details, you've, you know, the devil's in the details and probably there's reasons for 
for not more cases being then executed after the first one. Because if it's so easy to do, then probably more people would do it. And a lot of times when it comes to tokenization, what I've learned is that this big news that you hear of, when you start looking under the hood, when you start looking into it, sometimes or most times, unfortunately, you see that it was more or less a marketing stunt in the end or a marketing approach or a PR of an attempt in the future. And then when you follow up and see if that attempt was actually executed and finalized, unfortunately, it hasn't been, right? So there's, I'm not saying that's always the case, but sometimes, you know, it's hard to understand. And, and I think there must be, I mean, I know that there's reasons for it. And the reasons is in the end, knowledge of all the parties involved. So education, I think, is one of the things that needs to kind of also come. It's not just regulation, but it's also education of people working at regulators and regulators themselves. It's like people need to understand how blockchain works to be able to regulate it. If you don't know the principles of what it can do and how it can be utilized, then, you know, you can't create rules for it to, to grow in that sector. Yeah, I agree with you. Really needs to happen. Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk for a moment about the internal organization at Block Square. You know, because at Polyweb, we look at the strategies and tools also that prominent projects use internally. You know, to grow their business. And you mentioned that uh, in a previous conversation that we had that uh, Block Square is a DAO. You know, so I'm very interested into the entire concept of DAOs, uh, uh, especially in DAO-led companies. Uh, so can you please maybe elaborate on uh, what it means to be a DAO-led company and how it actually works in reality? I mean, the DAO seems like this new concept, but it's not really. It's something that's been around for some time, right? even before blockchain, actually, it's the principle, the principles have been around for forever, which is basically creating an organization where essentially anyone with can express an interest in to contributing there. You might have seen, you know, in the era of the internet, you might have seen open source projects that where you have contributors from different parts of the world contributing to a, a common cause, right? And Unfortunately, there with open source projects, sometimes this is not kind of rewarding in terms of finance, right? Fin financially rewarding uh, contributors. Then you have organizations in the past with multiple shareholders where people can basically just, you know, enter uh, into building uh, effectively into that organization. The DAO is kind of combining the principles of or organizations and a token economy. Basically, DAO is an organization where the decisions made within that organization are led by the holders of its token. And how, how we kind of built BlockSquare is in the direction of decentralization, decentralized ownership through our own token. This is for us on one way, on one side, it's for us a, a source of financing. And on the other side, it's, it's also a governance tool. So the main concept of DAOs is to build out a strong community of people that have kind of common interests. And this just, it's not just about bringing value to its own token, but actually bringing value to the products that the DAO kind of holds. When it comes to the reality of dealing with the day-to-day -day of DAO, right? Uh, so I mean, you like that you, I don't know, submit proposals, you know, of things that you want to do and those proposals get voted, you know, by the members of the DAO. Uh, what happens if uh, you really strongly want to push for something as the founder of the project, you know, because you really believe in it, uh, but then the DAO instead believes something else. How do you 
how do you reconcile these different aspects? Uh, oh, you, you just do what you want. <laughs> now, the thing is, the thing is how you set governance. And I think this is a journey. Governance should be a journey. And you need to assess somehow how, which checkpoints uh, should be put in place and change governance rules within the DAO organi as an organization, right? So, for instance, um, we started just by saying, okay, the decisions made are mainly of the two main co-founders, which is Victor and myself. We make most of the decisions. Of course, we also have, you know, advisors and colleagues who we take advice from. But we then decided that after this initial phase, we're going to pass on or increase governance or change governance, the governance structure. And now we have appointed a, a governance board, which is composed of two members of the team, which in this case is still Victor myself, two advisors and two members, active members of the community. So now we have, we're in the stage where this is the main or the main uh, board for making decisions on behalf of the whole DAO. And what we decided to add seats as we grow, as we achieve certain milestones, we're going to add community seats to this board. So we're kind of increasing the voting power of the community as we go. And in the, in the third play, in the third phase of decentralizing governance, we are going to pass on to full on-chain governance, which is not then anymore a governance board dissolves and only the holders of tokens become the decision makers of, of what happens with the protocol, which changes can be done. Um, Danny, so there's a wrap up our, our interview. Thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Well, thanks, thanks uh, for, for having me. I hope uh, it was interesting and yeah. Uh, see you on the next episode. Bye. All right. Bye. That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It would be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode.